Hi, this is Pastor Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Friday, November 13th, 2015. Ooh, Friday the 13th for those of you who are afraid of such things. No fear here. Uh, anyway, this channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to start off by saying that I probably won't be able to make uh, any messages next Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday because we're taking our family to Washington, D.C. Um, our foreign exchange student is a scholarship winner, and we've been contacted by our congressman, and he's going to give us a personal tour of the White House. Hmm. Hoping to meet Obama, possibly, and have a few words with him. Wouldn't that be interesting? <laughs> I wonder if they've done a background check on me yet. Actually, I know that they have, so I'm surprised I'm still getting to go. Anyway, <laughs> so just keep that in mind next week. Uh, probably won't get back until Tuesday evening. Uh, wait, Wednesday evening or Thursday morning, I don't know. Anyway, uh, amazing that now the Jews are back at Joseph's tomb in Shechem, Israel. It's It's been painstaking, trying to repair the damage the Palestinians have done. They've firebombed his tomb yet again. It's at least the, the tenth time in the past several years where they've tried to destroy it. Now understand something. Muslims claim to hold Joseph in high regard. They revere Joseph and, and say his tomb is sacred. So why have they tried to destroy it some at least ten times in the past couple of decades? You know, in Genesis... Joseph um, had a promise from his brothers. He, he made them promise that after his death, they would carry his bones from Egypt back to the land that God had promised an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in Genesis 50, uh, about verse 24 and 25. <clears throat> Moses fulfilled that promise. And Joshua 24, 32 describes the burial of Joseph's bones at Shechem. I've been to Shechem. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to go to Joseph's tomb because it was pretty dangerous for someone like me. Why do these Muslims want to do away with Joseph's tomb if they claim it's so holy to them? You know, this tomb isn't just about Joseph. It's a monument to God's faithfulness in fulfilling the promises that he made to his people. Promises regarding his people, Israel. His land, Israel. Joseph described Israel as the land that God had promised an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This tomb is physical proof that God keeps his word. You see, that's why Muslims, who, who publicly will say they hold the site sacred, that's why they keep trying to destroy it all the time. That's why they keep trying to say, oh, the Temple Mount is ours. There's never been any Jewish temples there. Oh, there was no Holocaust. Oh, it was... Ishmael that Abraham nearly sacrificed. You see, they're constantly trying to do away with the promises that God made to his chosen people, the Jews, and trying to put themselves in place of God's promises, trying to make themselves heirs to the promises of God. That's why they do these things. That's why they deny there were ever any Jewish temples on the Temple Mount. That's why they say that, oh, Muhammad went to the Temple Mount, uh, even though he never did. Jerusalem's never once mentioned by name in the Quran, ever. Not once. So that's why we see these things happening over there. Um, did you see this? Uh, this story's out of Haaretz. Uh, you know, um, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, was here in America asking Obama for an increase in the amount that America gives to Israel. You know, currently we give them $3 billion a year, I guess. Well, Obama just gave $150 billion to Iran in this nuke deal. You would think he could up the ante for Israel. I mean, who's he supporting if he gives 50 times more to a rogue Muslim nation that seeks to destroy Israel? We see who he's supporting. Netanyahu asked Obama to recognize the Golan Heights as under Israeli sovereignty. Today he got his answer out of Haaretz. White House official says U.S. will not recognize Israeli sovereignty in the Golan. Obama administration officials rebuffed Netanyahu's suggestion, 
saying it undermines Washington's policy in Syria and could harm ties with Syrian opposition. So Washington rejected Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's suggestion to U.S. President Barack Obama at the White House earlier this week to talk about the possibility of U.S. recognition of Israeli rule over the Golan Heights. Obama says, no, sorry. Oh, but I got your back. I'm the greatest president ever for Israel. I'm, I'm the greatest thing Israel's ever had for a partner in peace. I'm, I've done so much for Israel. Yeah, no, you haven't. You've been the worst president ever for Israel, Mr. Barack Hussein Obama. You need more proof? Check this out out of the Jerusalem Post. Maybe you heard that the European Union is labeling Israeli products. Have you heard this? It's pretty much well known all over the place. Out of the Jerusalem Post, Hamas welcomes the EU decision to label settlement products. Labeling settlement products. Hamas, the Islamic organization that rules Gaza, said it welcomes the EU, EU's decision to approve new labeling guidelines for products that originate from areas captured by Israel in the 1967 Six-Day War. Hamas spokesman said this is a step in the right direction. Um and included that he hopes all products and services exported by the occupation and not only confined to settlement areas. So Hamas welcomes the EU's labeling of Israeli products. Okay, Hamas, Muslim organization that solely exists to seek Israel's destruction. Okay, guess who sides with them? Out of Israel National News, Obama approves of EU labeling of Jewish products. Obama siding with Hamas. They're in agreement on this deal. <laughs> so he's on the same side as Hamas, a Muslim organization that solely exists to seek the destruction of Israel. And he agrees with them. Well, more proof that like he said in his book, Audacity of Hope, I will always stand with the Muslim and Arab people. Not the Jews, not the Christians, and certainly not Israel. Certainly not Americans either. So Obama approves of the labeling. He says because settlements aren't part of Israel. Really? God's word disagrees with you, Mr. Barack Hussein Obama. I'm going to go with God's word over a stinking man's lies, I can tell you that. Moving on. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu out of United with Israel. He said he denounces this shameful EU move to label Israeli products. Just so you know, Netanyahu reminds the EU that the labeling of products brings back dark memories implying a reference to Nazi efforts to single out the Jews of Europe. This singles out Israel specifically. He said, this hasn't been done to any other country or any other territory. Why are you doing it to us? He said, it's shameful. The EU should be ashamed. Who's Obama agreeing with? Not Israel. He's agreeing with Hamas, the Muslim Brotherhood, the ones that seek Israel's destruction. He agrees with them. Hmm. Out of Israel National News, there is no solution to the Arab-Israeli conflict. No solution. M.K. Benny Begin said he didn't see any possibility of an agreement with the Palestinians on the horizon. He said, many of us mistakenly think that if we can give up land so the PLO will sign off on a conceding language, the Palestinians never waive their right to the land, he said. He said, a change in the situation requires a change in the Arab leadership. Um... They won't recognize a Jewish state. They won't recognize that Jerusalem belongs to the Jews. There's no solution here. So when you reach no solution, what usually happens? They usually fight, which probably is what's going to happen because we, we see of some wars like Psalm 83 and Ezekiel 38, 39 that speaks of these wars against Israel. Psalm 83 looks like it's happening even now. Because all these groups of people are saying, hey, let's make sure the name of Israel is remembered no more. And the world's coming out against Israel. We're seeing it happen. Understand something, people. This is another one of those things of God's plan that has to come to pass. You know why? It's because his word says it will. And even though we're going to 
not like it, even though we disagree with it, even though we know in our hearts that it's humanely wrong to go against Israel the way the world is doing, it has to happen. It's one of those things that no matter how painful it is, it has to come to pass to fulfill God's word. So, you know, you can sign all the petitions you want. You can denounce all these movements you want. But it's going to happen. The whole world comes against Israel. Now, that doesn't mean every person comes against them. We as Christians and followers of Jesus can continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem like the Bible commands. In Psalm 122, verse 6, we can continue to bless those instead of curse them, even though our leadership curses them. Okay? I think God will not hold us responsible for the bad decisions the leadership of the world makes when we aren't in agreement with those decisions. God is very just. He's very perfect. He's very holy. I don't think we will be blamed or punished for the choices made by our leadership. I mean, the Bible talks about in, in Psalm, though a thousand fall at my right hand and, and 10,000 at my left, I will not be afraid, for thou art with me. Okay? So understand, nothing and no one can take you out of God's hands. No one can remove you from the love of God. We will continue to praise Jesus. We will continue to spread the good news of the gospel, even when it becomes illegal even when it becomes punishable by death, I will shout it even louder. Out of Israel National News, ISIS bombing takes out senior Hezbollah leader. Lebanese media reveals senior Hezbollah security official among 45 dead in dual blasts in Beirut. ISIS says bombers, Palestinian and Syrian. Now understand, this isn't a bombing from Russia or from America. This was a double suicide bombing at a Hezbollah stronghold in Beirut, which was claimed by Islamic State as a senior official in the Iranian Shiite terror proxy Hezbollah. This official was named Haj Hussein Yari, or Abu Murdada, a senior figure in the Hezbollah security system. Over 200 people were wounded in these blasts that the White House rushed to condemn. Muslims killing Muslims. Interesting. Took some out. Another one seems to have been taken out. Out of the Wall Street Journal, Jihadi John, terrorist and ISIS beheading videos targeted by U.S. airstrike. Officials assessing whether strike killed British citizen Mohammed Imwazi, who's suspected of killing James Foley and Stephen Sotloff and others. They think 99% sure they got Jihadi John. You know, maybe you saw his YouTube videos a few months back where he's beheading Americans, Christians, and others, they'll all stand before God. They will all give account for their actions. Um, we heard that Israel went into Syria a few days ago and took something out by the Damascus airport out of the Jerusalem Post. Now we know what it is. Hezbollah weapons warehouses were the target of Wednesday's Israel airstrikes in Syria. Okay. Uh, the target of Israel's alleged airstrikes in Syria on Wednesday evening were Hezbollah weapons warehouses, Arab media affiliated with the opposition to Syrian President Bashar Assad reported last night. So they took out Hezbollah weapons warehouses. Where are they getting these weapons? From Iran? Possibly from Russia? Do you think that might anger Iran and Russia? Do you think that could be a catalyst to cause Iran and Russia to come against Israel? Well, first of all, Iran needs no excuse to come against Israel. They have a deep, inbred hatred that Satan has blinded them with for centuries. So any excuse they can have to attack Israel is fine with them. But Russia, Russia's going to have to have a hook in the jaw, Ezekiel tells us. I think it's the oil and the gas that Israel now has. Um, out of the Jerusalem Post, interesting story. The ICC issues first report on war crimes and Palestinian-Israeli conflict. It's funny, but you probably won't hear much of this news. The International Criminal Court's Prosecutor's Office released its annual report yesterday 
including his first preliminary report regarding alleged war crimes committed by Israelis and Palestinians since June 2014. Its greatest, greatest focus, of course, is on Operation Protective Edge. Um, but it stated several interesting things. Uh, of course, Israel is complying and working with the ICC and supplying everything they need while Palestinians aren't complying at all. They aren't giving them any reports. They're not working with them at all. Um, Israel has an engagement with the ICC over competence issues. That's code word for trying to convince the ICC that there is no state of Palestine. And the ICC cannot investigate IDF personnel because the IDF's own investigations of its personnel meet international law standards. But it's interesting what this report says. Uh, let's see. The report noted that 4,881 rockets and 1,750 mortar rounds were fired by Hamas at Israel, indicating these incidents are war crimes. The report echoed IDF military intelligence, stating that out of the more than 2,000 Palestinians killed, at least 1,000 were civilians, as opposed to the 1,600 civilians claimed by the UN. Uh, the report mentions allegations that Hamas launched attacks from civilian locations like schools, hospitals, and mosques. <laughs> Are you going to hear any of this? Probably not, because that would pretty much paint Hamas in a bad light, right? They don't want to do that. They want to paint Israel in a bad light. And this report coming out pretty much is showing everyone, yeah, Hamas is to blame for what happened. Hamas was firing rockets from hospitals and schools and UN uh, facilities. But yeah, Israel's the bad guy because they're defending their people. Israel's the bad guy because they helped nurture back to life some of these wounded Palestinians that sought their death. I don't see any reports about any Palestinians providing medical treatment to any Jews. Completely devoid of any of that. You know why? Because it doesn't happen. See, the Palestinians like death. They don't like life. They value death more than life. See, Israel values life. Of course, this report went on to uh, talk badly about Israel, some of the things they had done. Very interesting report, though. Did you see this? Out of virtual Jerusalem, Iran says it will receive the S-300 systems from Russia by the end of the year. By the end of the year. They've signed the contract. They should have delivery by the end of the year. Kind of puts a timetable on Israel being able to strike Iran's nuclear facilities before they get this very high-tech weapon. Out of Christian Post, hundreds of Christian fighters battle to defend biblical Syrian town from ISIS. Hundreds of Christian fighters from across Syria have united to defend a biblical Syrian Christian town from being conquered by the Islamic State terrorist organization. Uh, ISIS militants continue to push west toward the Syrian capital of Damascus. The jihadi group began an offensive in the Assyrian heartlands on October 31st. Christians are coming from all over the country to prevent ISIS from conquering the town of Sadad, which lies about four miles from Mahin. Sadad is referred to in the book of Numbers and the book of Ezekiel as Zidad, seen as a very strategic town on the highway that connects Damascus and the city of Homs. I think... Christians need to understand something. There could easily be a time when we're called to take up arms. Okay? God commanded his people many times to go in and wipe out entire nations, including women and children and cattle. God doesn't change. just want to remind you, same God yesterday, today, and forever, the Bible says. I know a lot of Christians live with the mentality of turn the other cheek and understand something. That's when confronted one-on-one -on -one with another person and you have an argument. It's not talking about when an army is advancing against you, seeking your death. There could be a time when we must take up arms to defend our families, to defend our homes, to defend our country, to defend our lives. Now, I get it. 
we have God on our side, but there's a time you have to take action. How many battles did King David fight at the command of God Almighty? The walls of Jericho. There's so many battles in Scripture where God commands them to kill the enemy. Let's get into the word. In Psalm 30, Psalm 30, verse 11. I know I'm probably going to hear from a lot of you over those last comments. But, you know, we are in the army of God. You realize this, right? We will be taking up swords at some point, riding with Christ in his army, defeating those who oppose him. If we're going to do it in his kingdom, just saying. Psalm 30, verse 11. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. To the end, that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. <laughs> yes. Yes and amen. Isaiah 51, verse 11. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. And everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee forever. I, even I am he that comforts you. Who art thou, that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die, and of the son of man, which shall be made as grass? And forget the Lord thy maker, that has stretched forth the heavens, and laid the foundations of the earth, and has feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor, as if he were ready to destroy. And where is the fury of the oppressor? You ever dance at a funeral? It seems like that would be... Um, a little awkward, right? A little out of place, a little unthinkable. You know, funerals are a time of sorrow and mourning and weeping. You know, we expect funerals to bring sadness and tears, not joy and celebration. I have to say, though, I've got a lot of friends that at their funeral, there will be a celebration because we know they're with the Lord. But we mourn for a lot of reasons. I think each painful loss kind of grabs our emotions, causes us to regret past actions and missed opportunities and start to wonder what it might have been or if only I would have... You know, nothing hurts more than the death of a loved one. I mean, we, we miss our spouse or our child or our parent or our friend. We, we want to hear that familiar voice, feel the person's touch or... <clears throat> Tell them I love you one more time. All throughout scriptures, though, we learn that one day, God's going to turn our mourning and our sorrow into gladness. He's going to turn our sadness into joy. That's God's plan. Because we know him. Our ultimate destiny is heaven, everlasting life with God the Father. We have this assurance that one day all the sickness, all the death, all the sorrow, all the sin is going to be banished forever. It's going to be gone. We're going to be perfect. We're going to be complete. We're going to be just like Jesus, the Bible says. All the earth, all the pain, all the sin is temporary, but our joy is going to last forever. I like that. I like that a lot. In Isaiah 12... If I can find it. <laughs> How did that marker fall out? Um, okay. Isaiah 12, in verse 6, it says, Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. You know, when Christ was on earth, a lot of times he would slip away from the crowds and spend time with God the Father in prayer and reflect upon the majesty and the greatness of God. And as followers and believers and servants of Jesus Christ, we need to learn from his example. We need to take time away from the busyness, the craziness of the world and, and get by ourselves and gain a perspective of our lives and, and reflect upon the greatness of God and the plan that he has for each and every one of us. You know, if you have some stress in your life, I think the key is to walk 
humbly with God every day. To lean upon Him and not our own strength to get us through. Uh, at the beginning of the day, we need to reflect upon the infinite greatness, the incredible majesty of God. And I think, at least for me, it helps energize me. It helps give me a joy. It helps put a smile on my face. You don't know the number of times I've had people ask me, why are you always smiling? <laughs> and it's a perfect opportunity to talk about the joy of the Lord that's within me, the joy knowing that I will have everlasting life, the joy knowing where I'm going to spend eternity. And they can know this too by coming to Jesus Christ and accepting him as Lord and Savior. Very important. I, I think people need to take every opportunity to witness whenever they can. Um, because we're given a lot of opportunities. We have a lot of people that come across our path every day. In fact, I like to, one of my prayers in the morning before my feet touch the ground is, Lord, put someone in my path today that I can lead to the cross of Christ. And it happens all the time. In 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. It, it seems... <laughs> the more I carry on this ministry on here, and, and I'm trying to grow it, I'm I, I'm trying to expand and 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 do so many things. I I just want to help in so many ways. I want to get the word out, to get the gospel out. I want to help build churches in Africa. I want to help build orphanages. I want to go preach in various places and share the good news. But it seems like the more I do this ministry, the more people like to either argue with me or come up against me or say things that kind of catch me off guard. It seems that Christians these days are more on the defensive. They, they, they have their guard up. They're not out there on the offensive sharing the good news. They're just waiting for someone to slip up, waiting for someone to say the wrong thing. Uh, and, and please understand, I'm not accusing anyone of anything, but I think a lot of preachers and pastors and teachers today are faced with people who are pretty knowledgeable of the word. Their guard, their guard is always up. Um, I think it's pretty rare for people to come to a video like this or to go to church completely humble with their head bowed down like that one on the street that was beating his chest and saying, Father, forgive me, a sinner. Couldn't even look up into heaven. I don't think we see any people like that these days. I think we see people these days who are kind of built up and puffed up in their, in their faith, in their walk. They, they think they have an answer for everything about Scripture. They think they know everything. And I, I would never claim to know everything of the Word. I've read through it several times and each time I still find something new and fresh that hits me in a new way that I've never understood before. Um, we need to have people that are ready to pray, dear Lord, I'm ready and willing to hear what you speak to my heart today, open my heart and my mind to receive your word. Seems people have become so worldly, so learned in the word, so sophisticated and bored and so religiously tired that the joy of the Lord is gone from them. That the clouds of glory seem to have darkened somehow. It's hard to explain, but we need to remain humble before the Lord and obedient and understand that it's not by our strength. It's only God's strength that works through us. Jesus said, without, apart from me, you can do nothing. A lot of people disagree with that. 
They're like, what about all these atheists? Look at so-and-so. They're billionaires. They don't even know God. They don't know Christ. Looks like they're doing something. Jesus referred to people like that as they have their reward in full. This life is only temporary, though. They're not going to take any of that with them. You ever seen a U-Haul behind a hearse at a funeral? It doesn't happen, people. It doesn't happen. Um, Jesus said in John 15, verse 4, the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. You know, do you remember when you started to bear fruit? You know, maybe it was when you came to Christ and you you believed in his atonement for your sins and you rested on the finished righteousness of what he did on the cross. And maybe you produced a lot of fruit then. I came to Christ at the age of seven. I, I feel like I grew up in Christ. I didn't do any great works as a kid. I mean, I, I guess when I got into high school, I was leading uh, smaller kids groups. I was teaching smaller kids. And then as I got older, I would help teach teenagers. And then, I don't know, from about 17 or 18 until about 25 or so, I was like in the wilderness. Maybe some of you who came to Christ at an older age, you know, after 18 or 21 or so, maybe you Remember something different. I mean, I remember the joy I felt the night I came to Christ. I was jumping around and I couldn't explain it. I was so happy. I was so filled. And <laughs> I don't think it caused me to go out and tell everyone else about him. And then I felt the call of God on, on my life in my 20s. And I, I kind of shunned it and thought, I can't tell others. I'm, I'm a sinner Myself, how can I tell others about my Savior when I'm such a wretched sinner? Um, but your fruit, showing how you serve, what kind of fruit do you have? Is it young fruit? Is it ripe yet? Is it, is it the kind of fruit that will bear more seed? You know, the closer you get to God, the more your fruit will grow. I think the greater your fruit will be. We need to stop standing in our own strength, though, and understand that through our weakness, God is strong. From Him, all my fruit must be found, because no fruit can really come from me apart from the vine. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself, Jesus said. It has to come through the vine of Jesus Christ, bringing forth the fruit. So we need to trust in Christ. Um, in Hebrews 4, Hebrews 4, in verse 14, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In time of need, you know, whenever trouble or disaster happens in your life or in your friend's lives, it's natural to try to comfort them in some way, right? I mean, you ever feel like, though, you said the wrong thing when you're trying to comfort somebody? Oh, I, I know how you feel when maybe you've never ever once gone through what they're experiencing, so how could you possibly know how they feel, right? Um, we all want to feel like we understand. We all want to be empathetic. It, it helps to know people who've gone through the same circumstances that someone is facing because you truly do know how they feel. But this passage in Hebrews assures us that Christ understands how we feel. He's been there. Jesus is our high priest. You know, each year the man who was chosen to serve in the capacity of high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies after his ritual cleansing, and there, in the presence of God, he would offer a sacrifice of sin, Leviticus uh, 16 or so. The priest 
was the Jewish people's bridge between man and God. Okay? Christ not only took on this role, but he himself became the sacrifice when he died on the cross. And by doing so, and dying in our place, Jesus endured and overcame every possible sin. There's a reason why God the Father could not look upon Jesus while he was on the cross. It's because he had all of our sins heaped upon him, and God in his perfectness cannot look upon sin. And on that cross, Jesus represented all the sins of the world. You see, he was covered in our sins, and we're covered in his righteousness. Those who've accepted him as Lord, Savior, and King. Now Christ sits at the right hand of God the Father. He intercedes on our behalf. He's praying for you and I. That's an encouraging word. Jesus truly understands our pain. He knows our weaknesses. You know, a single parent who's suffered horribly can be assured that Christ knew all about betrayal. You know, Jesus, I mean, Judas turned against him. Jesus knows all about loneliness. Peter denied even knowing him, one of his three closest friends. He knows about depression. Think how he felt when he was faced on the cross with being separated from God the Father for the first time ever. So when you feel alone, when you think you're dealing with something that no one can understand, just remember this. Jesus knows your pain. He knows your trials. He knows your temptations. And even though your friends might not understand, just know that Jesus does. Okay? We need to trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In Matthew 19:16. It says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing should I do that I may have eternal life? You know, on the surface, it seems like this rich young ruler was pretty right on in the way he approached Jesus and, and was seeking salvation. You know, he, he kneeled to Jesus. He professed him as good master. I always find that very interesting. He acknowledged Jesus as good, but not as God. I think it's pretty pivotal. Jesus responded with, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. I always feel like Jesus pretty much answered his own question. When he said, why do you call me good? And then he's like, because no one is good but God alone. Hello. He's trying to give him a clue. He's like, I'm God in flesh. I'm the son of God. I'm the savior of the world, the Messiah that was prophesied. I'm here before you. That's why you called me good. No one is good but God alone. You know, every major religion of the world will acknowledge that Jesus Christ lived. They'll even admit he was a good man, but they don't recognize him as God, and a lot of them don't even recognize him as the Son of God. Jesus said in John 3, 18, if you deny the Son of God, you're condemned already. You're condemned already. You know, they'll say he was a good man, but they don't recognize him as the Son of God. They don't recognize him as God in flesh. You know, if Jesus was only a good man, he couldn't save anybody. Jesus didn't come to just show us the way to God. He was the way, the only way to God the Father. No man could come to God the Father but by him. John 14, 6, he said so himself. He made this point publicly several times. It's the reason Jesus responded to this young man's questions the way he did. Jesus was saying, God's the only one who's good. You must accept me as God or not at all. I'm either all who I say I am or I'm nothing. This rich young ruler asked what he could do to produce salvation. What could I do? What can I do to save myself? He trusted in himself, and he believed he could accomplish whatever good work Jesus might request of him. That's completely opposed to the plan of salvation that Jesus came to bring. Jesus obtained salvation for us through his substitution. Sorry, mosquitoes. And he offers it to us as a free gift. All we have to do is believe it and receive it. This rich young ruler wasn't looking for a savior. He was trying to be his own savior. He wanted to save himself. I mean, Jesus referred him back to the commandments. You either need to keep all the law completely and perfectly, or you need a Savior. The law can't save you. 
Jesus wanted to turn this man from trusting him in himself by showing him God's perfect standard that no one could keep so that he would then trust a Savior and come to the realization that I can't keep all those laws. I need a Savior. Who can that be? He was standing right in front of you. How people could miss God in flesh as he stood there before them blows me away. How people can deny him today. I can't even fathom. I can't even begin to come to a point to where I understand where they're coming from. Christ has been amazing in my life. Christ has done so many things for me and has made himself so big in my life. I could never deny him. I want to get to the point that nothing could cause me to ever deny him. No sword stuck to my neck. No gun stuck to my head. Nothing. I'm going to stand strong on the word of God. I'm going to stand strong on the rock of my foundation, who is Jesus Christ, my Lord, my Savior, my King, the Son of the living God, the Messiah that was prophesied, the Savior of the world, God in flesh. That's my Jesus, Yeshua, Jesus, Emmanuel, Jehoshua, my King. I hope you know him. God bless you guys. Good Lord willing, I'll see you again next week. But remember, it may not be till Wednesday or Thursday. I love you guys. Take care.